This is CBC Here and Now. Another deadly day on the TCH. Three people die in a head-on collision on the West Coast. Canvassing, that's the number one thing that works. The keys to getting elected in municipal politics. Good dog, a boy in Labrador gets a pooch that could save his life. After a long, long wet stretch here in eastern Newfoundland in particular, clearing out. In fact, all of the province looking at some sun and cloud for tomorrow. The full forecast details are coming up. The death toll continues to rise. 15 people have now died on our highways since the beginning of August. The latest tragedy is a head-on collision today on the Trans-Canada Highway just west of Howley. Three people died and two were sent to hospital after two pickup trucks hit head-on near Howley Junction, about 50 kilometers west of Deer Lake. The accident happened on a four-lane, non-divided section of the TCH sometime before 9.45 this morning. The highway was closed for about two hours, but partially reopened around 11.30. This deadly accident comes just one day after three people were killed on the Conception Bay North Highway near Roach's Line. So what is going on here? Is there a big picture problem on our highways and even with ourselves as drivers? Here now, Zach Gowdy has that part of the story. Okay, we're driving up on the Outer Ring Road. Uh, it's a rainy afternoon, road conditions are poor, and we are going to drive the speed limit and see what happens. But of course, we know what's going to happen. Maybe the bigger problem here is that bad driving is what we've come to expect. It's been normalized. That is, until 15 highway fatalities happen in six weeks. Makes you wonder, makes you question as to whether or not there is something that is happening on our roads that uh, is leading to these tragic events. Jim Brazel is, in every sense, an expert on driving and drivers. He says, as hard as it is, we should resist drawing connections between and easy conclusions about the string of recent fatal accidents. Instead, Brazel says we need to look at the big picture, at our driving culture, and especially at our own driving habits. Are we actually uh, taking the time when we get behind the wheel to think about the task that the, we're about to undertake is probably the riskiest thing we'll do in our lifetime, and are we putting that aside now and seeing it as such a routine thing that we can do it with our left knee, some of us. Maybe our competence is not as high as our confidence is in terms of our ability to drive. The hardest part of solving any problem is admitting you have one. Brazel says it's time we admit that bad driving is a Newfoundland and Labrador problem. People might take me to task for this, but I'll say it anyway, that we're probably some of the worst drivers I've ever come across in this province. And I don't know, it's not a matter of the competence in terms of the ability, the skill level. I think there's been a general lack of education. An awful lot of people really don't know the rules of the road. They think they do, they'll argue with you. Okay, no surprise, uh, by driving the speed limit, we are being passed frequently and uh, aggressively in some cases. It's easy to notice when someone blows past you, clearly speeding, or the other obvious signs of bad driving, like someone not wearing a seatbelt. But Brazel says the most dangerous thing that happens on the road is simple inattention. Ask yourself, when you get behind the wheel, are you fully engaged? Does driving have your full attention or just the minimum amount? When you consider that the greatest risk in terms of distraction to a driver is actually daydreaming, that that's probably close to 60% of what causes distraction. Not the cell phones, I know as dangerous as they are in texting, but when we're not engaged in the task itself, it's as simple as that from my perspective, but it's probably not that simple. The important things rarely are. Zach Gowdy, CBC News, St. John's. Well, an afternoon at Signal Hill that saw a visit from the Prime Minister also featured a dramatic rescue. A 21-year-old hiker visiting from New Brunswick found himself stuck on the side of a cliff after straying off the beaten path. Liam Moxley realized he couldn't get back to the trail and called for help. Fire crews and a high-angle rescue team arrived on the scene and used a rope to pull him to safety shortly after 3.30. 
The fire chief says it was a routine rescue that could have been prevented if Moxley had stuck to the trail. Guys are uh, especially trained in, in these areas and uh, so they went down. Uh, you know, there's not a whole lot down there to, uh, to anchor ropes to. There's a lot of, uh, of rock in that, but uh, these guys are used to it. They're well trained, so anyway, they, uh, they hooked on and, uh, and got down and, and uh, made sure the young gentleman was safe and got him up safely. And in about 40 minutes, Liam Moxley describes how he ended up in such a precarious position. The local business community is upset tonight after meeting with the federal finance minister. Changes to federal tax rules are going to have an impact on the same middle class business owners the minister says his government wants to help. Here now, Peter Cowan is just back from speaking with the minister. He's live from our newsroom tonight. So, Peter, what did Bill Morneau have to say to the business community? Well, the finance minister insists that with these changes, he's targeting the wealthy who use tax accountants in order to find loopholes to pay a whole lot less tax, the things that the middle class doesn't have access to. Today, he had a closed door meeting with some of the business community in this province. Their message, though, they see this very differently. They see this as an attack on small business and that, in fact, these changes will hurt a lot of people. But Morneau told us this afternoon that the actual number of people affected by this is a whole lot less than many think. For those 66% of uh, small businesses, according to the CFIB, that are under $73,000 of income, we don't see these tax changes as having an impact. Uh, what we do see is the passive investment uh, income issue that we're highlighting. It is really not uh, an important impact for anybody that's earning $150,000 or less. Now, the Board of Trade presented some examples that it believes shows that that's not actually what's happening. For example, it gave one example where a person could end up paying 90% of their income to the tax man because of some unintended consequences. And will there, there actually be some changes as a result of these sorts of issues? Well, today, the head of the Board of Trade says she's not convinced. The best analogy that I can give you to this in terms of what I see is happening is like someone built a boat and there's leaks in it and they know there's leaks in it and they're putting the boat in the water and they're going, when I get in the water, I'll figure out where the leaks are too. I'll fix them then. Now, there have been plenty of concerns over these issues, not just from the business community, but today we've seen more liberal MPs say, coming out and saying they won't support it. Morneau said that there are, is time to provide the feedback up until October 2nd. The department will be taking these concerns and then it may make some changes. Reporting live from the newsroom, I'm Peter Cowan for Here and Now. One week after gas prices took a major hike, the cost is expected to come back down at midnight tonight. George Murphy keeps an eye on gas pricing and he chatted with Here and Now earlier today. Here's what he's predicting. Consumers can expect to see about 7.2 cents a litre down. And again, that's all stemming, of course, on uh, the recovery from um, Hurricane Harvey last week. Uh, of course, consumers will remember, I think, that uh, they did see a 13 cent a litre hit at the pumps. With about 95% of affected refineries back online, Murphy expects to see prices come down again next week, close to pre-Hurricane Harvey prices. The Public Service Alliance of Canada held a rally outside the hotel where the Prime Minister was meeting with his cabinet. The group is upset with the Phoenix pay system and how some workers in this province are still not getting paid. Here now is Jeremy Eaton now with that story. Hey, hey! Ho, ho! Phoenix system's gotta go! Ho, ho! Hey, hey! Yelling as they marched towards the Sheraton Hotel, a busload of PSAC workers did their best to be heard. The reason they're here? Because I'm owed a lot of money for my, my job, I'm not getting paid, and I owe a lot of bills. Radford is one of more than 150,000 workers across the country not getting paid after the federal government's Phoenix pay system hasn't worked out since it started in 2016. The group's efforts to get the ear of the Prime Minister didn't work out either. The peaceful protesters were quickly asked to leave the Sheraton Hotel property. With the appointment of a new Minister of Public Services and Procurement, this is a great opportunity to make a fresh start and to make the changes that we have asked for. 
to implement the measures that are necessary to treat us and the pay workers in Miramichi with the respect we deserve. The system's got to go, ho, ho, hey, hey. The government has estimated it will cost more than $400 million to fix the system, and there is no timeline as to when it will be resolved. Stressful isn't even the word. I'm owed so much. Thankfully, I don't have a student debt, but I just bought a car. I'm not getting paid. I have, no, I have bills to pay, and I can't pay them because I'm not getting paid. So I'm getting interest on my credit card because I'm not getting paid that I can't pay. <laughs> the PSAC rally didn't last long, about 15 minutes. Organizers said they would have liked to have stayed around and waited for the Prime Minister to come outside of this hotel here behind me. However, they didn't have the time, they told me. They had to get back to work. Jeremy Eaton, CBC News, St. John's. A trial date has been set for a man from Bishop's Falls accused of sexual offenses against children. Shane Penny has pleaded not guilty to three charges of invitation to sexual touching and one charge of unlawfully entering a residence. Penny is 20 years old. Police allege he illegally entered a camper in the community earlier this year and asked some children for a hug or a kiss. The trial is scheduled to start February 8th. Well, we have a good news update on a story we brought you a little over a year ago. Yeah, a four-year-old boy with type 1 diabetes in Happy Valley Goose Bay finally got his dog this week. A dog that could help save his life. Yes, Nathaniel Dale spent most of the last year fundraising to get a diabetic alert dog that can smell low and high blood sugar levels. Nathaniel's family uh, raised $20,000 to purchase and train the dog from a private company south of the border. And this week, Skipper, as you can see, arrived all the way from Las Vegas. For Nathaniel's parents, that means peace of mind. And for the animal loving Nathaniel, it means a new best friend. <laughs> for how long term health and and uh, the the acute times when there, there's lows oh, yeah. and highs yeah. and and uh, just the mental health of Nathaniel, I just thought it would be all together wonderful. It's a 15, uh, 15 year commitment. They're getting a diabetic alert dog in uh, the average life expectancy of a, of a doodle like this is 15 years. So, I mean, they got many years of, of Nathaniel with his dog. I mean, just think of the different life changes that Nathaniel's going to go through at his age now. He's going to be driving a car and stuff and he's still going to have Skipper right there by his side. Isn't that great? <laughs> what a great name, too, Skipper. Yeah, yeah <laughs> and that was uh, quite an effort for the family to come up with $20,000, mm -hmm. but they, they managed it. Nathaniel is going to be way bigger than Skipper. Yeah, <laughs> too long. <laughs> oh, that's good. I, I wish them best of luck with yeah, that. Absolutely. A dog with a life-saving snout. It's pretty, <laughs> pretty cool. <laughs> Well, up next, we talk about the mental health struggles faced by first responders in light of the death this week of an RCMP officer in this province.
Welcome back. Time to get to the weather. Mm -hmm. Bit rain. Of that old rain still coming it's down. Right. We haven't it's seen rain. much. We haven't seen much <laughs> rain over the last couple of days. So I don't, everyone saw it today and thought, oh, it's raining. Uh -huh. uh, yeah, no, it has been very wet since Friday, uh, particularly here in the east. We actually dodged a big bullet today. Most of those heaviest showers tracked just offshore. So our totals mm -hmm. now are uh, 205 millimeters since Friday. Monthly total uh, since the last night, this has yeah risen again to 222 millimeters in the rain gauge so far this month. And yeah, when you compare that to what we typically see in a month, 130 millimeters, we have gone well past that. And our September record is 271 millimeters. And so yeah, not far from not far behind that and a whole lot of September to go. So we'll keep you posted on these numbers, obviously, over the next few weeks. The good news, the rain gauges won't be touched tomorrow. Not a drop on the way for tomorrow. Still a few lingering showers and drizzle tonight. There is our low, which is again slowly starting to move off to the east. Still some lingering wraparound showers, though, moving on to the Avalon, the northeast coast. But you can see where the cloud cover has been pushing westward over western and then now central parts of Newfoundland. We're starting to see some clearing in behind. Uh, it has become a very, very nice afternoon and early evening for the western parts of the island, the northern peninsula. Labrador's been seeing some scattered showers. One line just rolled through Happy Valley Goose Bay in the last little bit. Webcam picked that up nicely. You can see the dark skies off to the east there after that shower sailed through. Now just mainly cloudy skies. Temperatures near 14 in Happy Valley Goose Bay. Now as we back things off, Again, this is the low that's going to depart. That low off to the north will continue to bring some isolated showers into the mix uh, for tonight in through tomorrow for Labrador. Still watching Hurricane Jose. Uh, again, no imminent impacts for Newfoundland. Certainly one to watch next week, and we're going to get uh, into more of that with your long-range forecast. So stick around coming up in the next weather hit tonight. Not ruling out uh, the chance for some uh, northern lights sightings uh, once again. Uh, it was There was a chance uh, last week, early the week before, uh, but uh, yeah, not too many people did get to see them, but there's another chance tonight that those northern lights will be visible. Best chance in terms of viewing cloud-wise, not on the Avalon this evening, but central and west. And Labrador, again, some scattered showers this evening, but after midnight, viewing chances really improved for the Avalon and as we roll into uh, central parts of Labrador as well. Labrador City, best chance will be this evening as well. So we start tomorrow in the 7 to 12 degree range for most of the island, a little bit warmer along the southwest coast, developing southwesterly winds here. That's why we see that bit of a warm punch. Isolated risk of shower for Cornerbrook at Labrador City, Happy Valley Goose Bay, looking in that 5 to 8 degree range uh, for you folks to start the day for tomorrow. Those shower chances will move into central parts of Newfoundland for tomorrow afternoon. That's about it though, and they're pretty isolated, uh, so that's the good news there. We'll get up to around 22 degrees in St. John's tomorrow, and they're mainly sunny skies, 17, partly cloudy skies tomorrow evening, and so that's the good news there. And you can see, isolated shower risk will be basically Bonavista Bay back through to the Humber Valley, Cornerbrook, Stephenville, Gross Morn in the early morning hours, and then that chance again marching eastward into central, and Labrador looking at a lovely day. Only risk of a shower will be along the north coast tomorrow. Temperatures ranging from 9 to 15 degrees, uh, 16 that is. Long range details are still ahead, Carolyn. The sudden death of an RCMP corporal on Monday has shaken the law enforcement community in this province and is once again highlighting the mental health struggles faced by people who are first on the scene to accidents and other emergencies. Trevor O'Keefe was an experienced and highly respected Mountie who was often in the spotlight in his most recent role as the RCMP media relations officer, but his previous postings were in places such as Clarenville, Holyrood, Bell Island and St. John's. O'Keefe's obituary says he lost a courageous battle with PTSD. It's a tragedy Scott Maxwell has seen time and time again. He's the executive director of the national group Wounded Warriors, which uh, supports people with PTSD. And he joins me now from Whitby, Ontario. Thanks so much for joining us. Thanks for having me on. Well, none of us can presume to know what Corporal O'Keefe was going through. But when you hear a story like this, what goes through your mind? Well, it's, uh, it's horrendous, not only for an organization like Wounded Warriors Canada that does uh, mental health programming for a living 365 days of the year, but just as a nation, we're losing um, time and time again, far too many of our first responders 
to uh, the invisible injuries of mental health as a result of their service to Canada. So it's, a, it's yet another tragedy for our country. And from your experience, what is life like for people with PTSD? There's a lot that goes with these invisible injuries, op the operational stress injuries, um, which of course PTSD is one of them. But as an anxiety disorder, it, uh, what it, it tends to happen all too often is they, the isolation and just the removal of themselves from, from everyday life and society, family, friends, their workplace, um, and it can ultimately can spiral to the point where, as uh, General Dallaire often reminds this nation, that invisible injuries, mental health injuries, can be terminal. How many officers do you think go through the same struggle? Uh, thousands of them every day across the country. This is not a provincial or regional issue. This is a national issue that affects uh, first responders, police, paramedics, firefighters from coast to coast to coast. So it's, a, it's very, very real as evidenced yet again. Uh, there are statistics saying that of those reported suicides from first responders in Canada were now nearing 50 this year. If you can believe it, it's staggering. And it's, it's a challenge to all of us to do more to help those in need, make them feel comfortable to come forward and seek the help they deserve to ensure, uh, as we know, one suicide is one too many and it needs to stop. So one of O'Keefe's colleagues told us that uh, if he was struggling, you didn't know it and that he was the type of person to lift other people's spirits. So how difficult can it be to recognize that someone is suffering so deeply? Well, as, uh, as comments from some of his colleagues, it, it, sometimes you never know until uh, it's too late. Of course, we've heard from uh, members of the Canadian Armed Forces, veterans, first responders talk about the uniform as a feeling of invincibility, superhero-esque. And I think that highlights the fact that um, it can be masked, some of the, the symptoms as an invisible injury with no, uh, no, no physical scars at all can be masked day to day. But of course, what we know all too often is, is what isn't known behind the scenes, what the public doesn't see, what their colleagues don't see, what the communities don't see. And I think that builds up over time when you're trying to um, mask your injury over and over and over again for months or weeks, months, and sometimes years, that can hit its breaking point. And that uniform, you know, is there an added pressure that comes with that uniform to kind of have that facade to pretend that everything is okay? For sure. I mean, look at the motto, service above self. This is something that these men and women live by every single day that they put their, they go to work. And I think one time when we're asking people to reverse the motto and think about themselves and care for themselves and take action to support themselves, that's something that just doesn't register or they don't feel comfortable dealing with. And you can imagine, they're trained to look after others, trained to run into situations that everyone else is running away from. So it's, a, it's quite a situation where you have to reverse all of that and begin just to look at yourself and think about yourself and deal with the issues that are affecting you. And I think as we see time and time again and hear all too often, it just doesn't happen the way that it should. So people receive the care that they deserve, which we know uh, there are thousands of people across the country that are in need of this care. Your group is actually coming to this province for an event uh, pretty soon. Yes, yes, we are. Rocky Harbor, our tribute to your service, hosting a program for 25 ill and injured couples, members of the Canadian Forces, first responders this coming weekend. It, it hits us, it just rocked us, as you can imagine, to know that there's someone like Trevor that could have benefited from something like this taking place the very same week. Well, Scott Maxwell, uh, thank you so much. Good luck with your event and uh, thanks for taking the time to speak with us. That's my pleasure. So how will you decide which municipal election candidate is getting your vote in about two weeks? We'll look at that question next.
People across the province are filling out their ballots for municipal elections. The official date is September the 26th, but much of the voting in St. John's is happening this week through mail-in ballots. Hundreds of candidates in the province have put themselves forward. In a moment, we'll meet three of them from St. John's, but first, here now is Anthony Germain speaks with political scientist Amanda Bittner about how difficult it is for challengers to win. When we talk about the incumbent advantage, Amanda, how does that work in municipal politics? Is it more accentuated? In a lot of ways, yeah. I mean, the municipal elections tend to be the lowest level of information uh, available. So we don't tend to cover them in the news as much. We don't have as much information about candidates. We don't know about public policies. We often don't have parties. And so those kinds of cues that are normally available to voters in provincial elections, federal elections, aren't there at this level. And so name recognition is huge. And once you've been there, the odds are good that you're going to be there again. So what can uh, relative unknowns do to improve their name recognition? couple of things. One, canvassing. That's the number one thing that works. Door to door. Go to door to door. Absolutely. Uh, signs work too. Um, unfortunately, money talks like in all uh, levels of politics. So the more money you have to spend on campaign signs, canvassers, volunteers, phone banks and things like that, um, the odds are you're going to increase your, your chances of winning. It doesn't help also that all of these elections, there's so many of them happening across the province, are all jumbled into one voting period, right? Absolutely. So, and this is one of the things is that as voters, we all have jobs, families, hobbies, things to do besides studying public policies and what's going on and what different candidates think and say about different uh, topics. So this means that it's a lot more challenging for voters to know what to do. And as a result, we fall back on kind of the old standbys. Um, do we know this person? Do we recognize their name? Have we seen them on the street before? Have we seen them at our doorstep? And so these things all matter. Okay. So as a final question, uh, I'll hire you as here and now's uh, municipal election consultant. What advice would you give to people who are trying to knock off incumbents? What do they absolutely have to do? Because there's not much time, right? Most people are, are, will probably have voted by the end of this week. Yeah, so again, the door-to-door -door campaign is key. They absolutely need to convince people that they're the ones for the job. Um, and it's challenging, again, because most voters don't know a lot of people, don't know a lot of, of about public policies, don't know a lot about what's going on. And so just interacting, just talking, just getting your name out there is, is key. All right, thank you very much. Thanks. And uh, joining me now in the studio, three candidates for Ward uh, 3, and they are Jamie Korab, Peter McDonald, and Walter Harding. Thanks very much for being here. Now, the incumbent in your uh, district, in your ward, is not running. So one of you is going to be the new <laughs> councillor for Ward 3. That's <laughs> Well, uh, let's talk about what it's been like to be on the campaign trail. We just heard Amanda Bittner say that <coughs> name recognition is the name of the game. Uh, and because you aren't running against the incumbent, it's up to you guys to, to get yourselves out there. I'll start with you, Walter. What have you been doing <coughs> to make yourself known to voters? Well, I was honored and proud to run in 2013 on a $1,000 budget. Um, I'm not ashamed or embarrassed to say that my wife and I are strictly in the middle of middle class. We don't have a lot of money to be spending on a big campaign. Uh, we live a frugal lifestyle. We're not a wasteful bunch of people. So we decided to take $1,000 of our life savings and try again. Um, I'm not so much, as a voter, I'm not so much interested as what comes out of wallets and purses. I'm sort of what comes out of here for me and someone who gives a lot to their community, someone who does stuff that they don't brag about, they just do things uh, for the good of the community. Yeah, and just briefly, uh, what is it you're doing uh, with that $1,000? Uh, the signage is important sometimes, but uh, I want to move along. But just quickly, an example of what you've been <coughs> doing in this campaign. Very, oh, uh, knocking on doors is my big thing since February. Uh, we have very few signs. I keep moving them every morning to make it look like I have more. <laughs> uh, the pamphlets that we have, we fold them ourselves, we deliver them ourselves. It's a very small campaign team, but it's, uh, it's big hearted. Okay, Peter McDonald, what are you doing to get your face and name out there? Well, Debbie, uh, as Amanda said, we've taken the approach that door-to-door uh, -door knocking is the way I can win this election. It's the only way I can win the election. And uh, we've knocked on over 5,500 doors in the last eight weeks. And, you know, we're talking to the residents and explaining to the residents what Peter McDonald's going to offer those residents in Ward 3 with respect to my education my leadership experience, and in particular the fact that I've, uh, you know, I made a commitment to the people, I'm going to be a full-time counselor. So Jamie, 
you. Yes. Um, I announced I was running in the middle of May at the Muse Centre in Ward 3. Um, shortly thereafter, within the next week, I started door knocking. So I've been out since May when I started door knocking, I was wearing gloves. And last <laughs> night, you could see your breath out door knocking again. So uh, there's only been, I think, three days I haven't been out since May. And that was two torrential downpo uh, downpours. And I had a slight injury, which kept me away from the door. So for me, it's been out door knocking. Uh, I've got somewhere between 80 90 percent of the ward knocked on so it's been great to get out and meet the people uh, so for me I, that's first and foremost because i think that's important uh, you know i've got some signs up i've sent out some brochures as i want people to know uh, more than just curling I, i'm in this uh, for the right reasons and my um, involvement in the community what is it walter at the door that makes this one-on-one -on -one connection with somebody important? I get in trouble because my friends say, Walter, you can't spend 45 minutes at one door. <laughs> but I do because I give the as, a, as an informed voter, I sort of like want to give uh, them the opportunity to ask me questions. As a voter, I want people to stand in front of me, let me ask yeah. the questions until I'm finished. Uh, that can sometimes lead into a half an hour and 45 minutes, but how do I turn away? How do I turn my back on someone who wants to know so many things that's important to them? Some people say, well, it's only one vote. Yeah, but it's not a vote, it's a person. They want to talk. Do you find that it's difficult to move along quickly when uh, you're canvassing like that? As it's went on and on, and then after Andy Wells announced he was running, and now that the media is covering it, as Mena said, it's not, the media doesn't cover, unfortunately, municipal elections as much as they do provincial and federal. But now that people are informed and they've uh, seen the brochures and they've checked out the websites, you're getting a lot more questions at the door. So, it, and it's great to hear. I, I've been in some great conversations with people about issues, about heritage, about taxation. Uh, and it's great to see that people are engaged. Mm. Peter, what do you find when you're at uh, the door? And can you tell if they're really going to vote for you? <laughs> the answer to that is no, but I do trust them. <laughs> you know, I do trust the, the voter. But, uh, you know, very similar. The, the voters in Ward 3 are very, uh, I have tremendous respect and faith in, in those voters. I was fortunate to meet thousands of residents in Ward 3 as my time as principal of Brother Rice and Beaconsfield. And, you know, I will say this, uh, the residents are very much in tune with the, uh, this election and, and the issues. And also, they're very much in tune with the, the gravity of the responsibilities that come with being a councillor in a city the size of St. John's. So for me, I've been selling my credentials, obviously, going over my credentials, what I have to offer, and what I can bring to City Hall. You talked about uh, the money off the top, Walter. You're doing it on a shoestring, but how significant is it to have money, and how do you go about raising money for campaigns? Well, for myself, uh, I'm not a big fan of leaving big footprints anywhere. I found this place in a certain mm. situation. I've, I've been living my life to sort of make sure, make sure that my footprint is a small when I leave it. Um, that, of course, goes to our community cleanups and our neighborhood involvement and stuff. Money to me as a voter, I sort of like to get to meet people face to face, and then most candidates will, will admit that I've uh, approached them to have conversations with them face to face on this election as well to see why someone is running. Um, and I've been happy with what I've seen. Uh, Debbie, the reality is when you get into an election, you know, you, you are building your own profile, and you do need those uh, signs. People need to know who you are, and they need to understand that you are serious about running. Uh, in this election and that'll get you so far three you know for me it's all about knocking on the doors having that conversation listening to the voters what are the issues and really going through this is what Peter McDonald will bring to City Hall and similar to what Peter said uh, you know I have sent out some donation letters but first and foremost from the start I uh, financed my whole campaign uh, there has been some money come in the door from some people that donated which I thank uh, but more than 75% uh, of my campaign I've, I've financed myself and been, I've been very frugal with the spending compared to some other people in the city. Uh, it's just, you know, it, it's, it's a cost of, you know, a lot of times cost of running and, uh, you know, I put forth my own money for it and, uh, you know, partly, you know, to show people again, showcase what you have to offer. And uh, it's, again, it comes back to door knocking for me. That's what I've been out and do most. Yeah. And living in Ward 3, a lot of the issues Absolutely. that we talked about, I live in Cowan Heights, I've lived in Ward 3, so I, I know a lot of the issues. We're going to have to leave it there. Thank you very much. As I said at the top, one of you is going to be the new <laughs> councillor for yeah. Ward 3. You're all very up for it. Uh, good luck uh, with the rest of the campaign. Jamie, Peter, and Walter, thanks for being here. Thank you. Thanks for having Thank me. Thank you, Debbie. Well, here's a way to blow off some extra energy. That's four-year-old Isaac Hillier and his little sister Lucy. She's two. Well, last year, Isaac's dad competed in a fire fit competition. And Isaac's been setting up mock fire rescues in his backyard ever since. They practice aiming their hoses at targets. 
Isaac even went to the real thing in Fredericton last month. Looking pretty good. Welcome back once again. Inuit in Nunavut continue to play an important role in learning more about Sir John Franklin's ill-fated Arctic expedition. Their oral stories were critical in leading Parks Canada to the two ships, HMS Erebus and Terror. Now they're helping protect the National Historic Site and keeping the story alive. Kate Kyle reports. <laughs> Every few hours, Mark Ulikatak walks sections of Saunitalik Island, Inutitut, for the place of bones. Located on the Northwest Passage, the barren terrain is a short boat ride from Franklin's sunken ship, HMS Erebus. See if there's any sailboats coming through, so that's what we're here for. Ulikatak is one of 17 Inuit hired to watch over Franklin's ships, the Erebus and the Terror. Part of their job is to report on any unauthorized activity in the area of the National Historic Site. It's the first to be co-managed by Parks Canada and Inuit in Nunavut. Being able to, to have people directly part not only of the decision making but part of the action. The degree of preservation um, is, is astonishing. Since Erebus's discovery in 2014, archaeologists have spent more than 250 hours exploring the wreck, recovering 64 artifacts and even DNA samples. The team plans to explore deeper into the ship and right into Franklin's cabin in the years ahead, cross-referencing any significant findings with Inuit oral history. Inuit will also be trained to help document new artifacts. And we want people to be able not only to see them, but to be part of learning about them and then uh, training them into, into directly participating in the research and the understanding of the story. With the steady decline of sea ice in the Northwest Passage, Parks Canada says the Guardian program will eventually host visitors to the site, sharing Franklin's story, but also how traditional Inuit knowledge helped piece it all together. The nearby community of Joe Haven is excited about the future of the Franklin site and any related tourism and jobs. It has a, an impact um, by 
hiring uh, local people in the community. If it wasn't for the Inuit uh, oral stories, it would be much harder to find the, uh, the wrecks. At least one cruise ship is adding the site to its itinerary. Passengers on board will hear from archaeologists and Inuit, each of whom will share their interpretation of this evolving Arctic mystery. Kate Kyle, CBC News, Saunita Lake Island on the Northwest Passage. As we said earlier, a young man from New Brunswick won't soon forget his first Signal Hill hike. That's because the 21-year-old set out on the trail alone this afternoon and had to call in a high-angle rescue team for help. Here now is Andrew Sampson spoke with Liam Moxley following his rescue. I started at George Street, walked up one side of the mountain, came up here to see what it was like because my coworkers told me about it. And then I made my way down the foot trails and found a bunch of other foot trails people have made and well, I got carried away and went a little too far. So when you got down there, what happened when you realized you were stuck? Oh God, I made some phone calls, let people know where I was and told these people. So it must have been pretty intense to be there and have all these people sort of coming to get you. The first 10 minutes was a bit nerve wracking, not knowing what the hell's going on, but after that I was all right. Once I knew someone was on their way, I was pretty good. What happened with the rest here? How'd they get you up from there? God. They had some guy over there kind of on the telephone with me, kind of showed, well, telling me what to do, let him know that I was where I was at, and he was letting the, God, what are they called, the people that come down and help you. He was letting them know where I was and how to get to where I was, and they came down, hooked me all up, and we climbed back up. So it's kind of like you were rock climbing home? Yeah, kind of. It's pretty fun, actually. They gave me a life jacket, and it's like, I won't need that if I fall, really. <laughs> if I fall, I'm screwed anyway. Oh, I'm working here, actually, doing some pipelining. So how long are you in town? Oh God, I'm here till about the middle of October, hopefully. All right, so you ended up finishing the trail after. How did, how did that feel? Oh, that felt great. <laughs> felt like a little walk of shame though, coming back up to get rescued. So no injuries or anything? No, not a thing yet. So you think you'll uh, make a little hike on the trail anytime soon? Oh yeah, I'll be back definitely. Got to finish it at least. Didn't make her all the way. And would you say you've learned any lessons after today? <laughs> yeah, don't go down there. <laughs> It's easier getting down than it is getting back up. Lesson learned, stay on the trails. <laughs> yeah. yes. For everybody's sake. Yeah, and we have seen you've seen on Signal Hill how quickly the fog can roll yeah. in. Even when you're on the trail, it can be dangerous depending mm. on the conditions. So, uh, and the conditions are not great right now. No, no, definitely not. We've had a lot of fog. We've had a lot of rain. It's very slippery underfoot mm -hmm. as well. Um, now, as we look forward, things are brightening. I am keeping an eye on next week, uh, which uh, there has been some talk about uh, Hurricane Jose. Now, the satellite un shot, unfortunately, is uh, refreshing. That's why the, it uh, drops there, out there in the last second. But generally speaking here, uh, Jose is still a Category 1. Sustained winds near 120, gusts to 150 kilometers per, per hour. And as we look at that track, it's actually going to be wandering south over the next day or so and then start to wander off to the north and, uh, or pardon me, to the west and towards the Atlantic coastline as we roll towards the Friday, Saturday, Sunday, and into Monday time period of next week. Now, you can see where that cone, it's quite large between Bermuda and the U.S., and the forecast model spreads are actually even a further spread than that. The Euro model edges this storm up towards the U.S. coastline. The American model sits and swirls this storm uh, for quite a time next week as a big area of high pressure moves overhead. The long story short, beyond that four, five day National Hurricane Center cone, there is a ton of uncertainty with this storm. Certainly one to watch, but Jose, no imminent threat and lots of time to figure out where that one's going to go. So uh, no worries right now. Uh, there is the system that has been raining itself out over eastern parts of Newfoundland, the Avalon, uh, down towards the northeast coast. That low will depart. We'll see some clearing skies across the east tonight. Building clouds, risk of a shower early on for Corner Brook into the afternoon for central parts of Newfoundland, the northeast coast, and then across into Labrador. We are looking at shower chances from Nain. Uh, looks like it'll be north of Labrador City, just a slight risk there tomorrow. Temperatures near 9 degrees. We're 18 to 22 generally across Newfoundland for tomorrow and what will be a very fine Thursday. 
Flash forward to Friday, another nice one on the island. Temperatures into the 18 to 20 degree range once again. Winds a little more west northwesterly, so a bit cooler than we'll see uh, conditions on Thursday. 10 in Labrador City should get to 14, 15, 16 degrees across southeastern parts of Labrador. The weekend weather maker will be this. A trough line moving in from the west actually will develop into a weak low here. Long story short, it's a quick mover, but it does bring showers into the mix. Southern Labrador on Saturday. Uh, Western Newfoundland, Central Newfoundland for certainly Saturday afternoon. I think the Avalon and the Buren will stay dry on Saturday. That system will then sail through for Saturday night, lingering showers into Sunday morning, and then we are clearing out uh, through Sunday afternoon. Perhaps some late day sunshine, but certainly uh, not going to uh, bet the farm on that. Monday, Tuesday looking pretty good though. Sun and cloud mix, showers in the mix for Wednesday. And a look into Labrador, shower chances for Saturday. Uh, and again, Sunday, Monday looking good. Well, today's young athlete of the day is seven year old David Young of Paradise, who participates in soccer and karate. David also enjoys rugby and is pictured here after receiving a jersey from retired superstar rugby player Rod Snow. Yes, and we'd also like to congratulate David for his strength and bravery. He recently completed chemotherapy and will be participating in a walk for the Leukemia and Lymphoma Society later this month. Amazing work, David. You're today's Young Athlete of the Day. Some incredible images to show you coming out of Hawaii's big island. Lava flowed last week from Kilauea. Yes, it's the world most, world's most active volcano and it's had regular eruptions since 1983. This is part of an eruption that's actually been going on since last year and a particularly spectacular showing. Spectacular is the word. I want to get too close. I have relatives <laughs> who visited there not long ago. Oh, they were fascinated. Welcome back to Here and Now, and now for some national and international news. Ever wonder how much your paycheck has really grown over the years, or where you stand compared to others? Well, new numbers from StatsCan offer a fresh financial snapshot. 
Between 2005 and 2015, incomes grew more than 10 percent. The average household saw its income rise to just over $70,000 from $63,000. And the wage gap narrowed, but men were still making over $11,000 more than women. However, over that same 10-year period, women's incomes grew five times faster. RCMP in New Brunswick have confirmed a Mountie involved in a highway accident has died. The officer was a member of the force in Nova Scotia. Police say he stopped to help two people change a tire. Police say a utility van hit his police cruiser and the car he was working on. The two people in the car were taken to hospital. The driver of the van was also treated and then taken into custody. Tributes and condolences are pouring in for one of the most respected politicians of his generation. Alan McKechn, the former senator, cabinet minister and longtime liberal MP, has died. He was first elected in 1953 in Cape Breton. Among his accomplishments, overseeing the creation of universal Medicare, reforming the labor code and setting a new standard for the minimum wage. Alan McKechn was 96. Six people are dead at a Florida nursing home, which apparently lost power when Irma tore through as a hurricane. Once we determined that we had multiple deaths at the facilities and that the facilities are extremely hot, we made the decision to evacuate all of the patients from the facility. You're looking at aerials of the rehabilitation center in the city of Hollywood. It's about 30 minutes north of Miami. When paramedics arrived, they found a number of elderly patients in what they call respiratory distress. As a precaution, officers are che checking in on more than 40 assisted living centers in the area. Police say a criminal investigation is underway. A document obtained by CBC News reveals new details about the Prime Minister's controversial Christmas vacation last year. During that trip, Justin Trudeau stayed as guest of the Aga Khan on Bell Island in the Bahamas. Canadian taxpayers picked up the cost of sending members of the RCMP, Department of Defense, Global Affairs and the Privy Council. We're now learning the trip was significantly more expensive than the cost first tabled in Parliament. Selfie sticks may be all the rage on planet Earth these days, but as you can see, no one is floating the concept in space just yet. Mm -hmm. When it comes to capturing that perfect picture, the crew of the International Space Station let zero gravity do the work. <laughs> These snapshots uh, were taken just moments before three new colleagues came aboard yesterday, two from the U.S. and one from Russia.
This is interesting, from preteen to groom. This is time-lapse video of Montrealer Hugo Carnelier, who took a selfie every day for nine years. Oh. <laughs> the project he began at age 12 on his parents' laptop is going viral. And while he took a selfie every day from various locations, Hugo decided early on that he would not smile in any of his pictures. That is until his final selfie on oh. his wedding day. <laughs> No wonder that's going viral, isn't that great? Oh, I love that. that. That's some dedication to do that every single day. Well, when you're doing the work of God, sometimes it helps to have power tools. <laughs> this video of a chainsaw-wielding nun was taken by an off-duty police officer in Miami. Margaret Ann says she's just doing her part to clean up after Hurricane Irma. And all we gotta say is, uh, you go, sister. <laughs> <laughs> wow. Nice. Just enough time to show our viewer a picture of the day, which comes to us from Portugal Cove South. And a beautiful picture here oh, that reminds okay. us that the sun does still exist <laughs> and that we will see it across uh, a good portion of the province tomorrow. Yeah, get out and enjoy it. Yeah. I'm looking forward to that. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you all for joining us. Have a great night. See you back here tomorrow. Good, good night, night everyone.